Hello, friends. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Keep awake was printed on the wall of our kingdom hall. I went door to door with copies of Awake magazine to warn people that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. There will be no escape. Jesus will return with a flaming sword, seeking retribution from Satan and his system of things. Salvation lies in rejecting the world and learning the truth. This truth with a capital T asserts that there is a clear right and wrong. If you make the wrong choice, you will be severely punished. Forever denied by God, denied by the joys of paradise, doomed to an eternity of non-existence. If, however, you are a good witness, you will be reborn on the paradise earth where you will live in joy and peace for 100,000 years. We were instructed to always keep this paradise to come in front of our minds. We were taught that our heavenly hope would sustain us through this evil system of things and the great tribulation that would suddenly sweep wickedness from creation would come. You had to be polite and well-dressed, sober and act indeed, and perhaps most importantly, you were to always stay awake to the creeping influence of demonic forces. Every moment was a test of your resolve and faith, and errors could lead to disfellowship, being shunned and excluded from those that hold the light of truth against the darkness of the world. I think it is fair to say that the verses we are investigating today, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, played a large role in the religious trauma I experienced. We were taught to memorize this verse in full and make it part of our armor against demonic influence. As Paul writes, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, there will be no escape. The peace and security offered by secular communities or governments or friendships are ephemeral, always given to the satanic forces, always at play in worldly affairs. We must always keep awake to bear witness to the wickedness of a fallen humanity. We must always be alert to where we fall short of the example shown to us through Christ's ransom sacrifice. The God of my childhood was terrifying and severe in his judgment and in his wrath. Faith was a burden because we held a special knowledge denied by the world. We went door to door with copies of Watchtower and Wake not to convert, but to offer a deadly serious warning of the end times to come. You can imagine my dread when I was informed by the elders at my kingdom hall that I was straying from the narrow path, that I was allowing worldly influence into my heart, that I was in mortal danger. I was in the first year of my time at the Ohio State University. My aunt, concerned for my welfare, informed the elders that I was studying man-made philosophy. I was being exposed to new ideas, new ways of experiencing and interpreting human existence that challenged the biblical truths conveyed through the Kingdom Hall. I was given a choice by the elders of my congregation, join the theocratic ministry school and be trained for missionary work or leave the truth and continue with my education. Follow the narrative toward faith or continue to engage the demonic the worldly education, stay or leave. I joined the United Church of Christ in 2011 after years of wandering in the spiritual wilderness. It took me a long time to confront the reality of the religious trauma I experienced in my youth 
knowing that I had been misled and terrorized by people I loved and respected. This caused me to question everything I believed. And it has taken me years to unpack, rebuild, and reimagine God in my personal relationship with the divine. When I first entered St. John's United Church of Christ in Columbus, Ohio, I was certain I would be struck down where I stood. Instead, I found a new way to encounter God, to enter into a faithful community that values difference and the journey. I've come to know that our understandings and thoughts around God and the future of humanity are complex, messy, and they ought to be. Living is hard and full of doubt. Am I making the correct choices? What will become of those I care about? What hope is there in a world so often unjust, unfair, unrighteous? To be alive means to make hard decisions and to commit to those decisions in love and humility. Even our commitments leave us vulnerable to the contingencies of our times. One of the courses at OSU that I was taking during my time of decision focused on the question of evil. The core text of the course was Eli Wiesel's Night, the story of Wiesel's experience in the Auschwitz and Buchenwald concentration camps his battle to stay alive, these those arguments with the God who seemed to have turned his face from the Jewish people and the physical and emotional collapse of his father. In his Nobel Prize speech, Wiesel said, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. The experience of the camps and the world's knowing ignorance of the violence inflicted on Jewish victims in Europe taught Wiesel to be an ethical person means to pick sides, to make hard decisions. Wiesel followed up night with two more works which make a trilogy, Dawn and Day. He said the movement from darkness to light in these works, night to dawn today, mirrored his own experience of reclamation and recovery. Wiesel became a child of the light when he decided that he could not countenance silence, that he would devote his life to speaking out for and with the oppressed. Wiesel made his decision. Jesus was never neutral, he chose sides. And we are called to live into the challenge of rejecting neutrality, silence, in favor of those marginalized and hurt by the way the world is. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. The Peruvian liberation theologian, Gustavo Gutierrez, called this the preferential option for the poor. Our doubts and vulnerabilities, our traumas, are no excuse for the refusal to live in our faith and love. The complexity of the world cannot be allowed to reduce us to silence in the midst of oppression or to compromise the values we hold most dear. Jesus always sided with the oppressed he chose God over wealth, prestige, and safety. We may fail. We may have to live with the repercussions of our choices, such as ridicule or persecution. We may even just be wrong in our decisions. But we have an ethical duty to make commitments, to trust that God will lead us into the light. Returning to Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul writes, you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Much like Wiesel, Paul uses the metaphor of darkness and light to explore a movement 
from unknowing to knowing, our movement from silence to action. Knowing brings with it the responsibility to act. We have to, in a sense, stay woke, to turn away, to sleep through the moment, to live in darkness where we refuse to see the reality of the world around us. It's to turn away from God and the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our light, who reveals the nature of our reality. The oppression and domination which rampages through the world that must be confronted. When we are overwhelmed by the complexity of the choices we must make or ensure of the path that will lead us out of the wilderness, the living word of God can provide clarity. Just as Paul suggests, Jesus instructs us to live into the light with humility and love. And that salvation is open to us despite ourselves. We are called to act in favor of the oppressed, not to be always correct or to always win. The day of the Lord is every day we turn toward the light and love of God. When I entered that UCC church nine years ago, I met and talked with the interim pastor, Reverend Ronald Botts. He listened to my story, then led me on a tour of the church building. Then Reverend Botts did something that changed my life in a very dear way. He told me to explore other churches, other faiths, other denominations before choosing to attend his church. It had never occurred to me that faith is a choice. That we gather as a faith community, not out of fear of God, but because we choose God over and above the darkness, which often defines how people relate to one another. Notice the last line of our selection for today. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. We are destined for God, for life with the divine, despite ourselves, whether we are awake or alert, or whether we seek rest in our Lord. Constant vigilance is not required of us. We are only required to hold fast to our faith. As Christians, we are free to make choices not in fear of damnation, but in the confidence of our salvation. 12 days ago, I know it seems like forever ago, our country made a choice to turn toward the light and to attempt to emerge from four years of darkness. We still have choices to make. Every day as Christians, we are called to turn toward the light, to opt for the vulnerable. We must ask ourselves what is required of us in times such as these, when strife, hatred, and division threaten the promise of our democratic community. Last week, Pastor Veronica mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. and his relationship with Ebenezer Baptist Church in Georgia. The current pastor of Ebenezer, Reverend Raphael Warnock, is engaged in a runoff election for Congress. The name of my mentor and teacher, James Cohn, in the Black Liberation Theological Edition, tradition he exemplified, is being used to smear his good name and question Reverend Warnock's faith. Reverend Warnock is engaged in a battle for the morality of our political system to overcome the historical darkness, which often describes black life in America. It is true that God is not a Democrat or Republican God is greater than our politics, greater than our country, even greater than our religion. But we must make choices to follow the light and pray for clarity and for reconciliation. Last week, we also heard from Senator Robert Peters and his mission to end money bail here in Chicago. How is this mission called to you in these times? How have you been led to follow the light and participate? Right now, we all know people who have been hurt and damaged 
by the election, which took place a few weeks ago. Some of us even have to deal with family members who are struggling to find their way out of the darkness of the last four years. This will be a good time to reach out, not in unity, but in understanding and compassion and to act as a light toward those whose souls are clouded by domination. There will be no escape from the decisions we make. You must ask yourself where the light is and what is required of you. You are all children of light, children of God. Living to your promise and the commitments of your faith, our work continues. Turn toward the light. Amen.